a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, guys, we've got James Fox. He is the writer, producer, director of the movie The Phenomenon, and not the one with John Travolta, the really dope one about UFOs, the number one documentary about UFOs. So uh, everywhere that you can find this movie will be linked in the show notes, as well as his call to action to reach out to your senator, which we do cover in the episode as well. Uh, Enough of this business, guys. Let's get to the episode. You guys, thank you all so much for listening the mighty and powerful James Fox. Well, welcoming to the show is James freaking Fox, man. We got James Fox, the writer, director, and producer of the movie The Phenomenon. I told a bunch of people about that uh, I had you on. Unfortunately, the circle of friends that I run around with don't know too much about The Phenomena. It's uh, pretty challenging. They said, oh, man, make sure you ask him what John Travolta was like in real life. I was like, guys, <laughs> no, come on, man. Uh, no, The <laughs> Phenomenon, the amazing, amazing UFO movie, man. It's it's absolutely incredible. I, I cannot be more excited to talk to you about it. So, Mr. Fox, if you don't mind, just uh, for the audience that don't know you and that think you directed The Phenomenon with um, John Travolta John, John. there, yeah, if you don't mind, just tell them a little bit about yourself, man. Uh, well, uh, thank you for having me on, by the way. Dude. Um, okay. I uh, grew up with a father who was paralyzed from the neck down with multiple sclerosis most of my adult life. But, and he was a journalist, uh, amazing guy, uh, self-taught, raised in Africa, speaking Swahili, uh, came over from, and then he went back to, to England and then came to America. And he's like, I hitchhiked across America with, you know, $5 in my pocket back in 1963. You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> uh, probably went around uh, Socorro at the time of that infamous landing case. My dad must have been around. But in any case, um, I became my dad's legs, my dad's secretary, my dad's nurse, his chauffeur, because, uh, you know, he lost his legs, but he continued to travel and do his work. And we got to interview uh, people like Stephen Hawking, uh, who wrote Brief History of Time, the, 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 the theoretical physicist, uh, race car driver Dan Gurney. We, we did really cool stuff together. <clears throat> Never had a lot of money, but had a lot of wonderful opportunities. And uh, my dad was, you know, mainstream kind of journalist. I mean, he was independent and he would pitch stories to different magazines, but mainstream stuff. And uh, we had a wonderful relationship and a unique relationship because of the interdependence that was going on with him. And, and, and um, when I told him that I was doing a doc on UFOs, he was uh, surprisingly totally opposed. And, and he used to say to me like, son, I don't care if you, if you want to, you know, be a law professor or, or take the garbage out, as long as you're happy, then, then I'm happy. That's, that's all that matters in life. So I was really surprised at how opposed he was to the whole UFO uh, field. But um, I, uh, you know, being, I guess, a Taurus, I, I persisted and I produced uh, a film on the topic, uh, UFOs 50 Years of Denial, back in, uh, back in the late 90s. Um, I never had any intention on doing another, uh, documentary on the topic, but, uh, without boring your your audience too much, I I ended up getting invited to Russia and met with, uh, some cosmonauts and and some military generals in, in, uh, star city and, and, uh, a city called mineral water just outside of Chechnya again, back in the late nineties, probably 1999. Uh, it was right around the time when president Clinton was, was, um, uh, his sexual peccadilloes with Monica Lewinsky. And I remember all the Russian generals and stuff were, they were shocked that it was even making news because it was like, was, what does this have to do with, you know? Um, and, uh, and then I made another film called out of the blue, um, on the topic. And, and 
never, I said, I'm never, never making another film on the, on the topic again. Of course, I ended up doing um, a second version of Out of the Blue. Uh, then I did a film called uh, I Know What I Saw. And uh, people would ask me, like, you know, why do you, why do you continue covering this topic? Like, what is the fascination? What, what's the obsession? And I'd say, well, uh, if you wouldn't mind suspending judgment and imagining hypothetically if, if this was, was going on, if we, there was tangible evidence being withheld from the general public, um, that we were probably not alone in the universe, how significant of a story would you give that? And people go, well, God, well, obviously, if that were true, it's the most significant discovery of our time. It would be clearly the biggest story. And so uh, I, um, um, that's why I do what I do. And that's why I continue doing what I do. And when I set out in the 90s, in my 20s, uh, to produce the seminal documentary, you know, feature length documentary on the topic, uh, I was never satisfied with, with each film. And I learned from my mistakes. Uh, the last film I'd done prior to the phenomenon was a film called I Know, I know What I Saw. And I almost sold it to um, Lionsgate. They had an amazing global footprint. It would have been in their whole distribution. And on top of the fact that they would have paid me well. Uh, and it's a good film. I Know What I Saw. I still, to this day, I think it's aged well. But but it had kind of a weak narrative. And the production qualities were slightly subpar. And they ended up taking a pass. And so... In the back of my mind, I was like, "Well, if I ever get the energy and the, uh, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it one more shot." And so I spent eight, uh, the better part of eight years making the phenomenon, and I incorporated all the mistakes, corrections from the mistakes I'd made in the past. And if I couldn't afford to to do it the way that it needed to be done, I waited till I had the money to do so. I hired a National Geographic photographer. I hired a, a professional um, writer. Um, uh, that, that I worked with closely, um, and, uh, and and you know I had a budget, and we ended up with uh, with a film that I that I'm extremely proud of. Well, eight you know? years, and you shot a hell of a shot, man. I it, it, slam dunk is what you shot. I mean, it's incredible, I, and I still. I, I, I still love your older films, though. I can see the progression in it. You know, you can yeah. definitely see where you were and what you've come to and where you are, man, is only the beginning for you. Like, you get that, right? Like, you, this is it. This is only the beginning. And I want to I talk to you a little bit more in depth about the, uh, the my observations about that a little bit later. But uh, so when when doing this film, what was the best part about it like your overall arching this is the coolest part about this entire process the idea the concept everything about it besides the thought experiment of course and the idea of actual the ufo phenomena being something actually legit but in your mind your personal thing it it, it makes me think back to what your dad said about either a lawyer or a garbage man because it's a wide variety that's a scope right i mean yeah. in some people's minds and i mean you just nailed it with this thing i just think that it's awesome and i i've got to think that you've got to be really proud of this i you know i haven't watched it since i finished it because quite honestly i had um i have ptsd from the experience because the last year and a half push was uh, incredibly traumatic. Uh, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the complications and the obstacles that, that are inherent with producing a documentary. Um, there were some uh, legal issues and then COVID hit and we had a theatrical rollout. The ink had just dried from uh, 1500 theaters it was gonna be released in. And I'd done this whole uh, uh, Dolby 5.1 surround mix with a sound engineer and borrowed money from the bank to do the pay for the whole thing because people were telling me, you know, you're going to be in theaters. If your sound isn't right, the audience won't be able to identify what it is. It's irritating them, but they're, they're going to be irritated. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and you, you got to get that right. And so I remember thinking, you know, at the end of any film project, you're generally broke. I mean, that's just the way it goes because you push all in. Right. And, uh, and I, I took out a bank loan and, um, to my shock, I got it. Cause I didn't, you know, I, I got the bank loan and, and, uh, and I said, okay, well, I, I got two things I can do. One is I could pay for better graphics, which I kind of wish I would have. It's the only slight weakness in the whole movie for me okay. Two, I paid for the sound. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to pick one or the other, it's going to be the sound going to be in theaters. So I, 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 I spent, um, uh, six to eight weeks with a sound engineer. And um, I mean, my God, the, the, the surgery that they do is, oh, is yeah. 
it's quite something to, to witness. And, uh, you know, and then, and then, <laughs> then COVID hit. COVID hit and shut it all down. Ah. I mean, yeah, man, it was a lifelong goal. And I, I just, I remember thinking, boy, I didn't see this one coming. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you had it all planned out. You had this dope shit going on. And I had it all this. planned out, you know. <laughs> but, but in the end, I think that it served me well. I hate to say that because, you know, but, but uh, there, was a glo- there was a global shift in consciousness that, that happened. Um, and, and people were at home and, you know, uh, I don't know. I think that maybe the timing just was just about was perfect with all the circumstances and everything going on in the world. I'm a big believer in synchronicities, man. I don't think anything happens by accident. I really don't. And so, yes, to that point, and now look at your movie, man. Look what it's doing. I mean, because now you still have the opportunity once we reopen. You can come on the hell down to Texas and do it now. We're open. Come on. And Yeah, uh, you know, I'm going to – I'm actually – that's one of the things I want to do is is do a, a, a global tour of of, of theaters and, and give presentations and maybe do it with, like, someone like Lou Elizondo and Mellon and some of the witnesses in the piece from Africa, Australia, you know, demonstrate the global nature of the phenomenon. Um and 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 go on a tour and, and in fact it's really funny just recently i got contacted by a guy and he's like i got this bus it's the ufo bus and he showed me a picture of it. i was like wow this is this is quite impressive i've got this vision of touring america and i thought you know that's something that i that i would like to do even if i didn't make any money at all just to get it out there and have the experience interact with the people um you know that's that's important to me and and i've um um I never did. I never did any of this for the money. This was always something that I, uh, you know, I was digging dishes and, and painting houses and doing what I had to do to keep going. And there were times where I'd make a little money and then it would dry up and I'd be broke again. And, you know, and I would just persevere and, and keep going. Um, so, uh, and I'm very, very satisfied, not just, um, the financial success of this film, which is not, I mean, it's nothing in the world of big movie producers, right? But for an independent documentary, we've done very well, thank God. And, um, but it's the first time that I've seen the level of endorsements from high profile individuals on a UFO film that not only deals with close encounters of the first and second kind, but close encounters of the third kind. I mean, yeah, think about what was going through my mind when Senator Harry Reid, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, and whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter because this is a high profile po- politician, right? Yeah. And he's going to be connected to a documentary that talks about a UFO landing and aliens getting out and interacting telepathically with children in Africa in broad daylight. Like, think about that for a moment. It's massive. Like, uh, it's 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 mad, and I was having sleepless nights thinking that he's going to look at the movie and just say, "Take me out." Like, really? Because that's never been done before. You know, you're you're right, but I, I think that it, it was his opportunity to kind of get his side of the story out. And you can even tell when you're interviewing him for the film, in the film, he's just got this weight to him. You know, it's this weight Ooh. of just, God, I just want this out. You know, can we just tell the people? That that was a that was a, that was a, a wow moment for me. Uh I mean, you know, there have been a handful of times where I'm in the presence of someone so I don't say established, but uh, uh, it, it, you you literally pinch yourself and think like, how did I, how did I get here? How did I get in the room with this individual? How did I, President Obama, Clinton, Trump, uh, Bush? They're probably all going to see this movie because of this one man that I'm meeting with right now. They all know who he is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, that's just a weird feeling. It's it's a it's a trippy feeling. It's incredible. And and really though, the whenever he's you're asking him, you know, so some of the stuff hadn't seen the light of day, and he's like, most of it hadn't seen the light of day, man. And he just looks so defeated because he was the one that commissioned the the committee to keep moving forward with this thing. I mean, he actually allocated secretly allocated funds to a secret military project to continue the study of these things. Yes. And, it, and I think that the though that that's that's he's incredible. Cool. And it, what's that? He said the level of resistance he got from the intelligence agencies was was unbelievable. Yeah. Like he said it was like they were just, you know, 
Yeah, and he had lost. to fight and fight and fight. And some people lost their job. Like he said, it was Jesus. He never anticipated that. Yeah. And, and I mean, even to the level of um, Podesta and John Mellon, I mean, the people that you got in this are fantastic. So who's your favorite person to interview um, for this film? Uh, what, just one person? Uh, I'll give you two. I'll give you. Two. Okay. I'll give you two. I, I know it's hard okay. to pick. That's like asking me for a favorite say, guest. I would say, I would say Christopher Mellon, former Deputy Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. Okay. He was instrumental in getting the tapes out of the Pentagon that wound up on the front page of the New York Times. Christopher Mellon, he's so measured and articulate, and it just he's an amazing person just to be in his presence. Christopher Mellon, and Harry Reid. Okay. That's awesome. Those are great answers. Yeah. 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 But cool. but but the 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 day that oh, the week that we brought um, the the African witnesses now adults together for the first time in twenty years, that was quite a that was quite a day. That was that was one of those those days that you go, I'm not going to be forgetting this anytime soon. No, that is incredible, and what a way to cap off the movie too. Uh, mm -hmm. It's right? it's incredible. So I wanted to ask you uh, about a few uh, ancillary things in between there, and then we'll get we'll get to that as well. And then I just had some actually some just honest questions that I had for you, man, just about your direction and 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 some conversations I've had with people on the show about you and your film specifically. So the Lonnie Zamora case, if you don't mind, just for the audience, man, just uh, would you mind talking about that one for a little bit? Not not at all. You know um, when. Uh, one of my older partners had proposed doing the Lonnie Zamora case, and I'll remind your audience, it was a, it's a close encounter of the third kind. It took place in Socorro, New Mexico, 1964, April 24th, right around 5 p.m. And uh, Lonnie, the police officer, was on duty, and he was, you know, in hot pursuit of a speeder <clears throat> going through town. Something caught his eye in the in the in the in the in the sky. It was like a flash, and he thought that there was a dynamite shack that was kind of off 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 to the right, <clears throat> and he thought there might have been sort of an explosion or something. But anyway, he went to investigate. He he discontinued his pursuit. That speeder got away. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he went up this dirt road and 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 drove down this dirt uh, road, and saw what looked initially like down in a ravine, a little arroyo is what he described it. What he thought was possibly an overturned car. You're looking at something you haven't seen before. And a lot of times witnesses, their brains are trying to provide a conventional explanation as to what they're looking at. And they clearly can't. And he initially thought, well, there's an object down in this arroyo. It's gotta be a car, but it's not a car. And he's looking at it, and then he sees two beans, very diminutive. He described them as being rather small, walking around the base of this egg. It looked like a white egg with landing gear. And um, uh, there are different accounts. Uh, some of them I went over with his wife, Mary, that he was in his car with his head out the window and his elbow on the window seal and the window rolled down that he was actually calling out trying to hey are you guys okay you know kind of thing and uh, one of them apparently and i don't know i can't say definitively because there are some accounts where he he did say something to other accounts where he didn't but his wife seemed to think that he did actually try to speak you know hey are you, are you guys okay and one of them turned and looked him right in the eyes um and his wife said to me i you know i, I don't know what he saw but whatever it was he was never the same. Um, he drove a little further to get a closer look, and uh, he got within about 50 feet of the of the craft. The beans were no longer uh, outside of the craft. He'd heard the sound of what sounded like a hatch when he pulled up to it. Like a, he said, he talked about like when he was in the military, the sound of a hatch of a tank closing, uh, a heavy clunk, and um, and then the object lifted off with a blue flame. And he said it wasn't a typical flame like like a rocket where it would hit the ground and, and stir up the rocks and dust. It went into the ground like a like a warm knife through soft butter and didn't stir anything up. And then when it got to about 20, 25 feet, this egg shut off and went completely silent and no flame, nothing, and was just stationary and silent. 
and then it had a big symbol on the side that was three feet by three feet and it was red and uh, uh i found the it, it was a uh inverted v i don't know why they just got was it an inverted v with two lines in the middle and one line on top so it was like this with, with a line here a line here and one line across the top in red about three feet by three feet on the side and then it it, it flew off to the I think it was off to the west towards Magdalena. And um, there were military officers and, and police arriving on the scene, or police within minutes. In fact, one of, I have testimony from Lonnie on tape saying that, that actually one of the police officers arrived as the object was still in, in sight, uh, but he didn't want to get tangled up in the whole thing. Um, and then uh, military from um, White Sands, Holloman Air Force Base arrived within an hour and there were, the bushes were still smoldering and there were prints, not only from the landing gear, four, four pods, but uh, footprints corresponding directly to where the beans were standing um, uh, on the ground. And they were small pad-like thing. They were small, they were, you know. Um, and we have the diagrams from the military, the first military officer who's on the scene. Um, you know, drawings of the, the pads and the whole, uh, and, and the footprints of the beans and where they were located and all that stuff. Uh, and it's, it's considered the most well-documented close encounter of the third kind in U.S. history. Yeah, and it's in your film. You call it the sighting that changed everything, and I completely yeah. agree with that. So I had a question about the foot tracks. So this wasn't mentioned in the film, and I haven't found any reports of this. I was just curious if you came across it. That it said that yes, the small little foot pads, and in your in your film, the I think the dispatcher's son, right, uh, of that night. He yeah, had, yeah. Had drawn the yeah. uh, in the dirt and then yeah. set a quarter next yes. to it for okay. Yeah. So I I wanted to ask. So they found prints. Pablo but, Lopez. Yes, that's right. Did they, they found prints, but did they find tracks? Like, was there a leading to and from? It was just two. Well, they took, they took, uh, they came down off the craft. They took two steps in one direction and a couple steps in the other direction. And that was it. They didn't that, go anywhere else. Okay. And that's what I thought. I was just curious about that one in, in particular. And that was the case that made Heineck think that UFO landings were a real phenomena, right? That's the one well, that changed his mind. One of the side stories to this and that I learned, and, and, and actually one of the reasons why Jacques Vallée ultimately got involved with the production, and what an honor that was yeah. to work with Jacques. I mean, yeah. my God, I never in a million years would have ever expected that would have happened. Uh, but Jacques had seen that I'd put a lot of time into that case. I mean, I spent five years going back and forth. And I, I did a lot of interviews with, with his co-workers and his friends and that didn't make it in the film, with the local sheriff. Um, you know, you, you only so much, uh, you know, can get in the, in the movie, but, um, Jacques told when, when I told Jacques that I, you know, spent as much time on that, on that case as I had, and I showed him what I'd done. I think he felt like a distinct sense of obli uh, obligation to, to get involved because Jacques was at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in probably around April 20th of 1964 with Dr. Heineck and Dr. Heineck was giving him a tour of the base and Jacques was, 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 was asking Heineck to look into project blue book files that were categorized as psychological because witnesses that claimed to see beans were categorized as psychological. In other words, they were dismissed as like, you know, Looney Tune kind of stuff. And so Jacques was there telling Heineck, look, you got to look at these close encounter cases. They're happening in France. I'm sure they're happening here. You got to look into these things. These are incredible. And um, literally a couple of days later, uh, Heineck gets a phone call and is given the report of the landing case, the close encounter case that occurred uh, in, in Socorro. And um, if if you look at it's so funny because uh, I was in the edit room with this guy, Lance Mungia. He did a film called third eye spy on the psychic CIA program back in the, back, I think it was the seventies. And uh, he, he was really smart. He, he's like, you know, James, we're doing all this ar archive um, newsreel footage and, and testimonials from, from the forties and fifties and sixties uh, from different areas in like Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and he goes, you know, James, we should uh, we should get a map out, and um, and put pins in the map in these different locations. And I thought, ah, oh, that's a good idea, you know. And when we did it, we realized 
that a lot of this activity was within a certain proximity of the first atomic bomb detonation in 1945 at Trinity site. And we thought, well, that's interesting, you know, hmm, kind of like, hmm, okay, Roswell, Holloman, you know, uh, even an area of Texas, a hot spot in Texas in, the, in 57, there were landings in Texas. I'm trying to remember the name of the town that was yeah, in Maybe Aurora we as moved. well. Sorry? And then Aurora, Texas. Yeah. Uh, just out yeah. East. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, uh, we, we, we took note of that. And of course, later we found out when we met with, with, uh, with, with um, Senator Harry Reid that one of the more alarming or astonishing aspects of the phenomenon that they uncovered was this attraction to not only um, nuclear weapons facilities, but uh, in some instances they were interacting with and shutting off our nuclear weapons. So there's definitely a connection with that. I think so. And especially in your movie, you do detail as well, like the Maelstrom Air Force case with uh, Lieutenant Salas, and then the, as well as the uh, 82, the Ukraine missiles uh, that just arm themselves with no launch codes. And you guys go check this movie out. I know most of the audience has already seen it. It will be linked in the show notes. Uh, and then even the connection to the Rendlesham Forest case, uh, that all of these are fantastical. They do have a serious interest in our nuclear programs and actually the nuclear programs of everyone around the world. And I like the description that it said uh, that it's it's as if whenever they were shutting all the nukes off, it's as if they were taking matches away from children. Don't you love that? Yeah, I, dude, that is perfect. I think it's yeah. brilliant. And even uh, Lieutenant Salas, whenever he's at the uh, disclosure meeting and he turns around and just said, well, you know, it's like, why do you all still have these things? It's like they're pointing that out to us. And then he walks off and same Harry Reid type of thing. He's a little disappointed. You can tell there's a weight to the to the things that they understand and have experienced and then question themselves, which I find fascinating, man. I think it's wonderful. I, again, your book, your movie is absolutely incredible. I, I want to ask you a couple more things about this specifically. And then I kind of have uh, a question uh, beyond that that I haven't heard anybody ask you that. So great, um, great. So also, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, uh, Jacques Vallée's uh, pieces of debris or artifacts that he found that you guys took to uh, Gary Nolan and had yeah. analyzed. So what was up with that? Well, it's pretty cool. I was working with Jacques for at least a year, and I had no idea that he was doing this stuff. And one day, he called to have lunch and uh, we got together in, in person and uh, he said, you know, um, I think I'm going to invite you to a lab in Silicon Valley to do some filming. And I said, Oh, okay. Well, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, we're, we're doing some, we got this new machine, it's revolutionary technology and we're doing some analysis work and uh, we think you could make a good segment of the movie. But uh, because there hasn't been a publication yet of the results in a, in a scientific journal, he had to be conservative on what he was willing to, uh, to, to say regarding uh, some of the preliminary analysis of, of, of this study. Hey, look, I'll take what I can get. I mean, this is amazing because this is like physical evidence being studied in a laboratory. It could be repeated. And so uh, people complain like, oh, you, didn't, you guys didn't go far enough. I'm like, you know, it's not my fault. Like these are scientists, they're data driven scientists and they have a they have their protocol. And and uh, but I thought that was a fascinating segment. And and I was amazed at like, you know, Jacques, even in the lab, that's like a secure location, had the samples like this the whole time he didn't he didn't even set them down like and if he did set them down for a brief moment they were right in front of him and i thought jock uh you're you're, you're being a little funny with these samples talk about playing it close to the chest right yeah yeah, yeah. totally and he goes you know these things have a strange way of disappearing <laughs> <laughs> he's like there used to be a lot more of them <laughs> yeah yeah so but but I think that's to be continued. I think there's 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 more discoveries, and and Gary Nolan, uh, amazing guy. He um, he he um, he got summoned by the White House to study the coronavirus, uh, and and so that that aspect of what he was doing with Jacques got 
put on hold. I think it's starting up again now. Uh, so things are a bit delayed. But um, yeah, I mean, he got literally a letter from the White House saying, stop everything you're doing, go into this. And he was in a, in a full hazmat suit studying the virus a lot for like months. Wow. And you say that he had to hold back a lot, but what he revealed in there was incredible. And your movie oh, oh. is a banger through and through, like the historical breakdown that you have. You had a few cases in there I'd never even heard of, and I researched the subject quite a bit. And then you go into these parts of it, and then, of course, your contact part of it, which I also want to talk to you about. because um, So the uh, Papua New Guinea in 1959, the Australian missionary that was out there, with it was him and 38 people. So 39 people total saw a craft hovering... Yeah with four small occupants, and of course the, the, and it's been reported quite a bit, like the black uh, scuba suits or something like that that they're wearing, uh, standing on top of this craft that hovered there for several hours. And it's great the way that he recalls and describes it, because he's saying, you know, so they're just standing there, and so I just waved at them, and then they wave back. It's fascinating. So you're talking bipedal hominoids, you're talking, um, you know, uh, torso, legs, arms, head, look like us, just a little smaller, wearing little black suits, waving at these people, and then it just sped off. Now, I, I had a question about that. Were the, were the occupants still standing on top whenever it sped off at a high speed? Did you ever find that out? Or did they no, somehow get that, back that, in? That, 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 that sighting happened in 1958. For me to get my and, – and Heineck, Dr. Heineck investigated, investigated that case, I think, in the 70s. A uh, fascinating case, and people had really stood behind Doctor. Uh, it was I'm sorry, Father Gill, and um, getting the archive footage of that. Like I, I had to locate the guy who shot this documentary in the 70s. I found him. He's like old, really old now. He's like in his late 80s, and he's like, oh, I think I have the film on some weird format, and it took months and months and months. And then I said, look. If I need to fly out there to your house and help you get this process, like, you know, whatever, transferred or whatever. And uh, so we were very lucky to get the last remaining master of that interview with with Father Gill. Uh, Father Gill has been dead for some time now because that sighting happened in 1958 in Papua New Guinea. Um, but that was considered an incredibly, uh, incredibly a credible case. And, uh, and, and a nice prelude to, uh, to you know, to, to rule it. Yes, yes. So tell us about that, man. That's a, such a special part of the film, dude. And the fact that it ended there is going to lead me into my next question. So please. Right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start off by, um, and if I'm being long-winded, just tell me to shut up. But, we have uh, all the time in the world. It's your movie night. I'm just chilling. <laughs> so uh, I... I I didn't believe that that case happened when I'd heard about it back in the nineties. And so uh, I heard about it in 97 from actually from Steven Spielberg. I, I've mentioned this a couple of times in the past. And I thought to myself, and I was making a documentary on UFOs. I thought there's no way that a mass sighting with so many witnesses in broad daylight could occur. I, you know, it's inconceivable to me in the whole world, not know about it. I just, I just dismissed it so quickly. So I, I don't blame your audience at all if they say, you know, come on, a, a UFO landing at a school in Africa in broad daylight. I don't expect anyone to believe it. And I jokingly say, you know, I offer this Parmesan challenge where, you know, uh, I'll give you a chicken Parmesan dinner if, if you watch the film and then still believe that this, this, this event didn't happen as I'm about to describe. But it was about 10.30 in the morning. It was in a place called Rua. Zimbabwe, which is just about 30 minutes, 35 minutes outside Harare, which is the capital. And um, it was at a school called Aerial School. And there were roughly 100 children in the playground, give or take. Um, they all saw a weird object in the sky. Some of them claimed a couple of objects, some of them just one, but uh, the, these objects landed. Uh, some of them say there was uh, a, a, a larger one in the sky and, and a couple of smaller ones landed. But in any case, depending on where you were in the playground, people witnessed, you know, more than one or one. And uh, occupants got out and they were diminutive, quite similar to what, you know, Lonnie had described, small, childlike. 
In fact, I interviewed one of the kids. He was, we called him kind of like the, uh, the arc, the, the engineer, cause he was so pragmatic and matter of fact. And, and the, the person interviewing him says, well, how big were these so-called people or beans or whatever? And the kid goes, ah, about my size. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like in second grade, yeah. eight or third grade, <laughs> yeah, about my height. <laughs> he was really, really funny. And these big eyes and stuff. And, um, the children, uh, not all of them, but some of them who got within a certain distance of these beings, described a telepathic communication of environmental destruction, of not becoming too technologists, one of the kids stated, and um, being better stewards of, of the environment uh, of Earth and so destruction. Um, there was a Harvard psychiatrist by the name of Dr. John Mack that heard about the case. He flew... Uh, to the air, to the location within two weeks of it and with a camera crew. And he documented all the children on camera at amazing sit down interviews. He did interviews in the field. He did interviews near the landing site uh, in the playground. And then he did sit down interviews with the children one, one, at, one at a time. Uh, remarkable uh, archive material. Uh, we licensed that footage. Then we found with the help of this guy, Randall Nickerson, uh, we found the children 20 years later from all different corners of the world. And we brought them together for the first time in 20 years. And their accounts uh, today uh, is just as incredible as it was, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, they, they're adults. They've had time to process. They can articulate what they saw better. Um, and I would have to say that it's probably the most uh, compelling close encounter of the third kind in in modern history. Absolutely. Just because of the sheer volume of, 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 of testimony of eyewitness testimony, you've got over 60 kids saying the same thing, um, drawing the same thing, you know, some of them slight variations, but, uh, and then 20 years later, 25 years later, 24 years later, saying the same thing. Uh, it's, 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 and, I put it at the end of the movie. A lot of people are like, oh, this, 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 this sighting has got such an impact. And I went, well, two reasons why I disagree with that. One, I didn't believe it when I heard about it. Mm -hmm. So you have to build your case to get there. Yep. Especially if you plan on creating a documentary that's not going to preach to the proverbial choir. You're going to penetrate a much broader, more mainstream audience. You better like give them a little UFOs 101 uh, up to that point. Otherwise, it's, they're never going to believe it. Cause I didn't believe it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so um, that was the first reason why I decided to put that case at the end. And the second one is where do you go from there? That's my question. So I, I had had a, a gentleman named Robbie Graham on the program before uh, he wrote a book. Called, British guy. Yeah. 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 I wrote uh, yeah. silver screen saucers. Him and I actually were talking about you and your film specifically. What we, came to the question of uh, was is I we understand the reason that you did um, the film that the way that you did in the order that you went yeah Robbie was very interested in knowing about this oh see it or is it too blurry uh, move it to here uh, there you go I'll screenshot that for Robbie Wow. Damn. Robbie, what do you think about that, buddy? Damn, that's cool. Isn't it? Yeah, and you guys uh, watching this on YouTube, just pause and read that. That is fantastic, man. That's awesome. <laughs> that's the original. He's going to love that. Yeah. God, that's cool. Yeah. So we had, we had when when we had talked about this, and uh, you would love Robbie. He's fascinating. Very interesting guy. Uh, and just knows a ton. And, you know, film major uh, did that and wrote that book, Silver Screen Saucers, about the UFO's demystification and cover-up in movies and TV uh, in the early years, you know, based on the Robertson panel and 53's uh, recommendation. And uh, it was just a fascinating conversation. To your movie specifically, we were talking about the reason that you did the what you did, because him and I, like you, we've we've done this, right? We know this. But like I said, your breakdown on it was incredibly necessary, incredibly important, not only for the newbies, right? The, the newcomers to the idea uh, and taking a look at the topic seriously. But also, like I said, there were a few cases in there I'd never even heard of. And the way that you related them all together was fascinating. So the, the question that we had and something that I'd mentioned to Robbie was now you have 
the world's attention with this topic. I mean, you're, there's been tons of documentaries made on this, none like this and none with this impact to the people. And like you said, I, I believe in synchronicities, man. All of this happened for the right reasons at exactly the right time. Not only with the Leslie Kane article that came out, um, but also with the Nimitzcraft footage with uh, Fravor coming out. There, there's a, a domino effect of reasons why all of this is so interesting, and you did such a great job with this. Now, my question is, and what Robbie and I had talked about was, you have the world's attention now. Are subsequent films that you're going to make Keeping in mind that this is only the beginning for you, are subsequent films going to have more of the ancillary parts of the phenomena in it? Let's say, for instance, abduction cases, um, uh, d missing time. Even Jacques Vallée will talk about how there's all sorts of things that you have to ask the witnesses if they'll be honest with you, with you which is another issue, right, with the reporting. is because people won't report that they got probed or whatever. They'll just say, yeah, I saw something, I lost three hours, that's all, that's all I saw. And they remember much, much more. But it's hard for these folks to report these things accurately. So the, the question is, is, will there be subsequent films now that the cat's out of the bag with this, you have the world's attention, to where those kind of things will be incorporated as well? Well, it's a great question, and it's funny because one one thing that I've learned <laughs> over the years is to never say never. Because every time I say hey, I'm never doing another film on top of again, because because uh, it takes a lot out of you, you know, it, it just does. And and people say, you know, why can't you produce your films faster? Like, can uh, you know, my response is. Sure, I could definitely. Like, if if you're gonna do maybe a documentary on a specific case, but I've been trying for 27 years to create a seminal documentary, you know, feature length film um, that can transcend the, the UFO community and and have a have an impact on on mainstream media because you know there is a colossal amount of incredibly compelling evidence a lot more than anecdotal that these things are real that we're not alone and uh they th there's there's a lot of uh a lot of noise around that core message that has deterred uh the average joe from from diving into the topic and 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 taking it quite seriously of course you got the robertson panel that adopted the the policy of ridicule uh, that didn't help um and and so uh i i been bogged down with creating this 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 concept of a film which is ultimately the phenomenon I, and i sometimes read i try not to because you shouldn't but i sometimes read like comments people say oh it's the same old rehash bullshit i'm like it's not first of all it's, it's not. not it's not and, you know and secondly i can't change history and third do you have any idea what i went through to find the archival material like i have archived material in that film that's never seen the light of day events that were put on the united nations in 1978 that the very person lee spiegel who put the event on hadn't even seen so <laughs> don't give me that crap that is say well yes i understand it's got you know elements of history that it's elements of history i can't change that but when i covered stuff like kenneth arnold i got his daughter kim arnold yes you I got did. The, yeah i i you know i went to great lengths to reveal and un, and, and, and overturn uh stones on on revealing historical gems on stuff we know about but but to the next level uh, and so um uh, but I can't change history. The history of it is, the modern history is what it is. And the more salient aspects, cases, are the ones that I focused on because they're the ones that got the world's attention when they did. And that's, you know, so, it, it, uh, um, and, but now, finally, I say, okay, you know, I did it. I didn't succeed with Out of the Blue. I tried Out of the Blue, a second version. I, you know, I did 50 Years of Denial. I, I, then I did Out of the Blue 1, and I was disappointed. So I did a second version of Out of the Blue. That was the director's cut. It's really good. I mean, I stand by it to this day. But but I still failed. And uh, and then I did I Know What I Saw. I got close. I failed again. Um, and then this one. And uh, and now I finally, like only recently, you know, kind of patted myself on the back and said, okay, now, now, based on the assumption that the phenomenon is real, we, we, we've We've, we've, we've established that, okay? And if you haven't seen the phenomenon, you know, when I move forward with these other projects I want to do, 
then that's your problem. But but I'm gonna I'm moving forward on the assumption that the phenomenon is real. Let's go further with it. Let's explore other aspects of the phenomenon. Let's open up an international dialogue with the Harry Reeds of Chile and France and Australia and Africa and in different countries in South America and um, China, Russia. Uh, that excites me. That um, the, 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 the push that we've seen here in America for further transparency um, uh, with Lou and Chris and people behind the scenes at the New York Times and all that stuff, uh, that's very encouraging to me. Uh, you know, some people have uh, their reservations uh, about them. Oh, they're government insiders. Hey, great. You got government insiders that want to uh, tell the public what's going on. Nothing they've said is conflicted with any of my research that I've done for the last 27 years. In fact, I'm taking notes half the time. I'm, I'm on board. Let's let's do this. You know, so I'm extremely encouraged, and um, I, I I I haven't revealed publicly what my plans are uh, now, but I can assure you, um, they're big. Okay. They're, they're, I trust I, you. I, I'm telling you, yeah. I trust you. I, Robbie would kick me in the ass if I didn't if I didn't at least ask you that question. Yeah, we no, both kinda... I promise you that it will be coming out, and 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 it's and and. You won't be disappointed. Okay. No, no, no. I trust you. I'm telling you. Uh, you you've kicked it off with this. And and to the other movies, man, you're being too hard on yourself, dude. Like I said, all of those were necessary. They're and they're great films. That they, they you needed that to get you to where you are. So every step you take is what leads you to where you are. They're not failures. They're just a step in the, in the road on the way to the phenomenon, man. The number one documentary out, man. It, it's huge. And then, and then, like I said, this is just the tipping point. This is just your start off. Now, uh, to the disclosure part of it, I, I think I'm with you on it. I've got some serious reservations that we're going to get anything of legitimate, uh, tangible, anything out of this. Uh, I think, though, no matter what they tell us, it's a step in the right direction, right? I had Stephen Bassett on the program with Darcy Ware, uh, incredible indie filmmaker, by the way, which I want to talk to you about. Um, he uh, was talking about disclosure, and he's been saying, you know, every year it's going to happen. Every year it's going to happen. And he reminded me of those people who say, well, Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime, and it never happens, right? Now, I think that I think we're pretty damn close, though, but I also have reservations on a government that's lied to us forever about everything and then just all of a sudden going to be altruistic for no reason whatsoever and just release the factual information. I think what they'll do is they'll continue to release probably some perception management elements of it. I don't think they're going to tell us the whole story. But, I mean, like I said, either way, it's a win. It's a check in the win column, right? It's a step in the right direction. Because, And honestly, even like uh, Harry Reid in your movie said, I think it was him or Podesta, that said it doesn't matter why or what. It just matters that we talk about it and that we get it out. And I agree with that. So um, to that point, and I uh, wanted to ask you a question because we're almost at the time we agreed on here. Uh, what do you what do you think the phenomena is? And regardless of what you think it is, what's the most cool theory that you've heard? Because there's tons of them, right? Um, that you would prefer it to be just for fun's sake, just for the thought experiment of it. Well, to be totally honest with your audience, <clears throat> I have absolutely no idea what we're dealing with perfect now, that's the answer ha yeah yeah having said that uh if i had to pick one um and of course i can't but if i had to yeah just for fun i would probably say that it's an interdimensional thing okay i like that i would probably say that they're around us all the time and that the fabric of space that they kind of slip in and out of our dimension, um, perhaps, and this is total speculation, but perhaps the detonation of the first atomic bomb uh, really got their attention. Uh, maybe there's some sort of uh, effect that that has on their reality or not, I don't know. Um, uh, but there's certainly a, a connection with our atomic activity and their um, increasing activity and, and, and curiosity and, or presence. Uh, I think that you'd be fool not to, to recognize that, that, that connection, um, whether it's relevant or a correlation, I, I don't know. I, I would imagine so. Um, if they wanted to make their presence overtly known, uh, they just have to fly over the Rose Bowl parade and it'd be a done deal. 
but they don't do that. Um, but they do do some pretty uh, overt things. Uh, you know, I think about the mass sighting that happened uh, in March of 1997 uh, in, uh, in Arizona. Phoenix Lights, hell yeah. That was a pretty bold maneuver um, uh, over the bases. And uh, it flew from the north to the, all the way across the state of, Ar of Arizona, uh, I think from 6.30 to 8.30, 9 o'clock p.m., maybe possibly as late as 10 o'clock. A whole armada of ships, right? So that was a pretty that was a pretty blatant display of 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 themselves. Uh, you know, you look at what they do, and you also look at what they don't do, and you kind of have to read between the lines. You know, they make them they make their presence known. There's no question about it, but they don't make it like super overtly, unequivocally. You know, like they chose a slightly more rural area. Um, an aerial school to land. If they would have landed in Harare, wouldn't it have been a different story? Harare is only 30 minutes away by car, probably a minute or two away by the way they fly. Or, or a second, a blink of an eye, yeah. Right, a blink of an eye, exactly. So, you know, and I think about this stuff all the time, and I wonder, because people say, oh, well, you know, the government releases this or they release that. Who is the government? Who has the authority to access this information? When Senator Reid says that they're, what we've seen is only the tip of the iceberg, and of course we've suspected that for decades, uh, who has the authority to release it? I've asked them, like, who does have the authority to release it? I haven't gotten a straight answer, to be honest with you. I don't know. And, and you know, people say, oh, well, disclosure is around the corner. Disclosure about what? Like, is there anyone that actually has the full picture? I doubt it. Do they know that they're they're flying around and they're under intelligent control? And yeah, of course they do. Do they know it's not the Russians and the Chinese or anybody else? Yeah, of course they do. Do they have debris and possibly bodies from Roswell and other possible crashes? Yeah, of course they do. But does that mean they have all the answers? You know, Maybe. I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe not. Um, I th they definitely know more than they're telling us for sure. Oh, no question. But... They know more than they're <laughs> right. Yeah. No question. Uh... Of course. Look, and I got to say, like, you know, people, I, I started this, this, this uh, call to action. Now, I had a call to action in the movie. Uh, you know, um, I, I, uh, one of the, one of co-producers, this guy, Dan Farrow, was like, you know, you should put a call to action in the movie. I was like, great idea. Duh. So we did. And then I had a call to action on the website. And then, of course, the 180-day deadline thing that got triggered by the signing of the COVID relief bill from President Trump in December of 2020. And we thought, hey, uh, let's, let's do a more focused effort and rattle the cages of our representatives and let them know that, hey, we're paying attention and we want, we want to see more government transparency. We, want, we support your efforts. And... Things have changed a little bit, but when I was walking the halls of Congress distributing all uh, 435 members of, of the House copies of Out of the Blue, uh, I had conversations with some congressmen and uh, uh, some chiefs of staff, and they said, look, you know, this is not exactly a, a career-enhancing uh, move to uh, go and, and – and, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so <laughs> if we hear from enough of our constituents that that's what they want us to do, we'll do it. So things have changed a bit, obviously, since the publication of uh, that article on the front page of the New York Times in, in December 2017, but still, they need to hear from us. So I launched a more focused campaign. I worked with Christopher Mellon. I worked with Lou Elizondo. We spent several weeks crafting the, the language, and uh, it's, it's UAPactnow.com, UAPactnow.com. It's free. We provide a template. We provide direct links to contact your representatives. We provide a telephone number to the switchboard. Uh, you know, uh, we made it as easy as we could possibly make it. Doesn't cost you a dime. Please, I encourage your audience. Uh, you know, we can make a difference to 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 contact the representatives and and push for further transparency. I'm going to make it even easier as well. You did send me this. I have already done it. Thank you, sir. And I'm going to be linking that in the show notes. So you guys, as you're listening to this, go down, scroll down, 
Click on the link. He's got a template in there, and it's got all the numbers and ways you reach a representative. Reach out. Let's make a difference, guys. Let's get these people on board with the fact that we do want to find out what's going on. We want more of it released. And like you said, the wave of it, that's a good career-enhancing thing, right? Because right now, they haven't heard from us. Not enough of us. So this is a great way, and it's, an, it's a wonderful tool to be able to use. So link down but, in the show notes, guys. Use it. So sorry. So sorry. The, the site was launched two days ago. Very little publicity. And uh, we've got 5,000 signatures already. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm one of them. So thank you. It was Wouldn't awesome. it be great if we could get 50,000? We got, we got 90 days. Well, yeah, I would love 500,000. Well, let's do that. It's not, keep this yeah. in mind, James. Uh, don't dream so low around me. All right, young man? <laughs> you hear me? This is a rule yeah. of mine, okay? There's an old saying that it's not that your goals are too high and you're missing them. It's a, they're too low and you're hitting them, buddy. All right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I like it. I, you know, uh, what if 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 five uh, percent of the uh, U.S. population did it? That would be quite significant. Let's do it. Roll out, guys. It's clipped down at the bottom. Do it. Click. Go now. One person does it, and he sends it to one person. Yep. That would do it. Yeah, that's it. Just start a chain email. I mean, I've already gotten the listeners on board. I'll send it to all the guests that I've had already. I'm already forwarding this thing around, man. So we'll do it's, it. It's it's the first time that I've launched an effort like this that has the support of. Uh, military and government officials. Hell yeah. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I know I want to get you to moving out here. One final question. So I wanted to know about your thoughts on, so I've had a, a guy on the show, an awesome, a doctor actually, named Dr. Michael P. Masters. He wrote a book called Identified Flying Objects. Have you ever heard of that? No, I think so. Awesome well, guy. Uh, you can check out the episode. Um, it's, uh, but I'll, I'll send you a link to his video. Uh, okay. Awesome dude. Um, so he actually, he is an anthropologist. He's actually a biological uh, professor of anthropology up in uh, Montana, Montana Tech. And smart dude, academic. And his idea about um, the phenomenon, and especially the entity specifically, is that they're future humans and time travelers coming back, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, lately, this has been one of my favorites. And like you, I don't plant my flag. I think when I asked you, that's why I asked you the way that I did. Not only uh, what do you think it is, because um, I was curious about that. I kind of already knew the answer. But then what do you want it to be if you had to pick a favorite idea, right? So that's mm -hmm. the reason I asked you in that way. Mine is this idea, this hypothesis. And he's got such a scientific breakdown on it. The way, you know, and he's an anthropologist, so he studied ancient hominids, and he knows, like, what our lineage will look like in the future, or you can kind of extrapolate that out, right? And it's interesting, too, because even in his work, he points out that there's millions of species that have evolved on this planet, but only one of them has been bipedal, and that's been us. So mm. all these accounts of even... Uh, the bipedals, uh, the reptilians are bipedal, you know, stuff like this. It gets pretty out there, but it's yeah. one of it's one of my favorite uh, theories about it. Now, the other thing I'm thinking of, and now I kind of view the phenomenon through that lens, right? Not not to plant my flag, I just kind of look into things. Now, whenever you were talking about Jacques Vallée in your film, whenever he said about the materials that you guys took to the lab, uh, he was saying that it doesn't mean that they were made in outer space, but they're it's like 200 and something different components to this, and we only work with 80. So, yes, it's not as if it was made in outer space. It could have been made in the future and brought back or been a technology that was made in the future and then brought back. Uh, to the other point of it, the interdimensional part of it, time machines would look a lot like that. Uh, they would look like they're just shooting off real quick or blinking in and out of existence, and interdimensional beings would look like that as well. It, it kind of checks that box as well. I, I like the idea. I just think that that's one of the more fun ones, like if you want to entertain the Ooh. thought experiment of it. I like that one. So, and I, as I was I watching about the film. That. I, I almost called the film All of the Above. Uh, that's a, okay, yeah. I like the but phenomenon I'm better. It's a little about, maybe it is All of the Above. And that's that's the thing too, right? I mean, maybe it's all of it, or maybe it's like what Heineck, Valet, uh, even uh, John Keel come to in the in, that it's a psychosemantic thing, that it's something we're the doing, Earth is producing. We're doing interplanetary, you know, flight exploration. Yeah, and we've only been in the air for what a little over a hundred years. So, you know, and it could be interdimensional, interplanetary. Uh, time travel. I mean, my God, this is a huge universe. Yeah. And what do we know? Well, what do we know? We don't, we don't know shit, man, to be honest with yeah, you. I think no, that yeah. it just keeps... A, we know that there's some mysterious shit going on out here, and we don't know what the hell it is. I think that that's... Yeah. And it's the people that are like, no, they're coming from Zeta Reticuli, and that's all they are, and that's all they could be. I'm just like, guys, come on, man. 
I yeah. mean, you know, it's an ignorant perspective. I get that we all kind of start there, but it's an ignorant perspective. And I, I don't claim to know what's going on. I, I really don't. People go, oh, you know, you're saying they're ET or they're this. I'm like, quite honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> but this is what makes it so great, right? Because you can't know. That's the best part of it. But you're wise enough to say, I don't know. I mean, that's that's the only, that's the, the correct answer, sir. That, sir, is the correct <laughs> answer, sir. Uh, and then, you know, whenever you talk about, and back to that real quick, was whenever uh, how interested they are in our nukes. And of course, this flap started showing up around 47 detonated the first atomic bomb in 45 future humans probably don't want us dicking around with this stuff right that could be another reason for the visitations for the interest in it for the technology developed to be able to disarm it so well or arm it well it it it's i don't know man the more the more i look at it the more i look at it in associated phenomena and the cases and when i go back and look at it especially watching your movie again i was like freaking time travelers man that's uh, got you know it's it maybe i don't hey, know hey it, it you know what we we know that time is malleable. Yep. We know that as time is relative to the observer. Yeah. You know, it fascinates me that they have actually taken atomic clocks. I think they took them to the moon and proved. Didn't they come back like a minute and a half younger or something like that? Yeah, and it, it's got to do with like you said, the relative time. And you, you hear about all these paradoxes, and in that episode, it was, but yeah. but different. Yep. Yep. Just from that travel, imagine traveling at the speed of light. You heard about the twin paradox theory, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it's just like trying to wrap my mind around that. You could have twins on Earth, okay, four years old. One of them jumps in a spacecraft, shoots off at the speed of light for one year. He comes back. He's five now. And his brother is an old man. That's like a fact. It's like that Inception, you know, Christopher Nolan's movie. Isn't that amazing? It's fascinating. I love that kind of stuff, though. And time travel is theoretically possible. Like, at least can somebody time just travel. like, can somebody explain that to me? I've had it explained <laughs> to me a couple of times. I read Brief History of Time. I, I, you know, I've watched documentaries, and I feel like at the time I can get right on the cusp. I'm like, I'm, I understand it, and then it's gone. But it's just like the phenomenon itself. It stays one step out of like we yeah, conceptualize yeah, yeah. some of this stuff, but we can't. You know, it's that one thing. It's right there. It's right on the edge. Like I said, I don't know. It's just one of my favorite ones to think about. And Dr. Michael P. Masters and I, you know, we break down uh, some time travel paradoxes. We talked about the movie Looper, and he hated it, and I thought it was great, you know, and all this stuff. So it was an interesting conversation, and it's kind of cool too the way he wants to do this because he's one of those academics, kind of like uh, uh, Diane Pasolka with her book, The American Cosmic. Uh, these are academics that are coming out and taking a good look at the phenomena in a way that they bring a scientific element to it, but they're at least willing to entertain the possibility and ask the questions. This goes along with your film. It's, it's a, there's a shift in consciousness happening surrounding all of this, and I think it's great. And it's like he was saying, and he says it in his book as well, that what we need to do is marry the physics with the philosophy. We need to marry the sciences with the ideas and come to a middle ground and figure out where we are with this, but have honest conversations across the aisle without the butt hurt and stuff like that. And it was right. funny too. I said, so how were you received by uh, the UFO community? And he said, horrible. I was like, I could have no told you that, man, I, because there's those people that are like, nope, they're interdimensional. It's freaking hollow earth. And they, yeah, just, yeah. Oh, God, they yeah. die on yeah. that hill, man. And I'm just like, it's just unfortunate. That's all. But like I you said, know, I, the consciousness yeah, no, I, 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 I have said that, and there's a lot of mudslinging that goes on in the UFO community. I, I, I will not engage in any of it, and I respect everyone's path and everyone's belief, and that's your business, and that's your, you know, trip, and that's great. Um, and I, I go about my path, and uh, and I say to people like, I, I, you know, I don't try to force any beliefs on anyone out there. I try to put the evidence uh, on the table and allow the audience to make up their own mind. You, you don't hear me saying, you know, E.T. has landed. I, nowhere in the movie. Look, the witness says, hey, I think it was E.T. or hey, I think it was an alien or hey, I think, fine. You can say whatever you think. I wasn't there. Yep. Whatever you think. And you can interpret that the way you want to. But I have to keep my opinion out of it. I really do. And I would even remember when I was doing the Rua section, I was adamantly working with this one guy and he was trying to push it. I said, no, I said, we're going to say if the accounts were, are to be believed, then this could have been this, but that's as far as I could go with it because a, I wasn't there and, and B, my opinion is irrelevant. So, um, 
You know, that's and 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 that might be one of the reasons why mainstream uh, has has uh, it, that it's been as well received as it has been. Um, um, yeah, so. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I'm completely with you. Uh, the way that you you have to really watch your speech whenever you're talking about this and citing things and quoting, oh so, my which God, you, yeah. you do a great job of it, man. It's oh, monitoring. It's I put, exhausting. I put my foot in my mouth a few times. But, <laughs> <That's yeah. okay>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, if I don't know something, I just say, I don't know. I really don't. I wish I did, but I don't. No, absolutely. And that's what I say here on the show. And like, I don't know, but let's speculate wildly, you know, because that's fun. Yeah. You know, let's just oh, get no, the, I, I'm happy as long as I know. Like I said something about a meeting I had with an individual who's pretty in the know, uh, or certainly in a position to be in the know. And I said that he had shared something with me and I wouldn't reveal his identity uh, that I, that I don't disbelieve nor do I believe. And I said this and I thought, eh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this. And then it was like, you know, tweets going out. James Fox says aliens are walking among us. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, that is no I didn't. not what I said. <laughs> So I thought to myself, well, I need to be even more careful. Maybe I don't even say that at all. Like, no, I heard it from somebody who told me that. Yes. I didn't say I believed that. But this is the part uh, of it, right? People are dumb. I mean, not everybody. I'm generalizing, <laughs> of course. I'm just saying there's a lot of dummies out there, and they're just going to put <laughs> words in your mouth. Now, what's great about that is anybody worth their salt is going to look you up. They're going to find out that that quote's inaccurate, and they're going to they're going to talk to you for five minutes or watch one of your films and know you don't have a stance. You you just say this is possible. Here's what the witness said, and these type of the, those types of observations, which are brilliant, man, and that's the true you. So don't worry about all those dummies again. Don't don't worry about that crap. Shake that shit off. <laughs> Keep making badass movies, man. James Fox, I can't thank you enough for your time, brother. This was incredible, man. Did you uh, want to plug anything? I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, put your. Oh, um... I'll just say that if you're if anyone in the and, people, and the reason why I'm saying this is because I've had people go, why didn't you tell me? It's like if you want to rent the film, just find the cheapest place. I think it's Amazon. If you want to buy it, then get it from Vimeo or iTunes because it comes with. Uh, three hours of bonus material, really cool stuff that I didn't make it in the film that I that I wanted to offer at no extra expense. Doesn't cost you a dime more, and you get three hours of really cool stuff. The presentation of the National Press Club, unedited, interviews from the seventies with Dr. Heineck, uh, interviews with generals in Washington, just cool stuff, and um, and 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 it really does help if your audience would take a moment and and rate the film online it's incredibly helpful it really is because other um you know streamers they look at that they look at those ratings of feedback and they go oh okay great well we'd like to have this on our platform and the film gets to be seen by more people yeah yeah spread the word guys and it's great uh we bought it on itunes and yes the extra footage is i'm fun, grateful right? thank you it's so much fun, fun man it's so yeah. cool it's like two extra movies it's great yeah i know <laughs> i put i talked it full and i got and and we've got some We've, I, I can assure you that we've got some really good stuff coming down the pike uh, I, in the near future. I trust you. I know it's going to be fantastic. I, again, I know why you did it the way you did, and you did a brilliant job, man. You, you're, you're masterminding this. You're 10 steps ahead of everybody. I'm on board, man. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. So thank you again. This has been a true honor, man, honestly. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. I, I, I really appreciate it. I really do. I appreciate any 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 uh, any attention and support is, is greatly appreciated. We've definitely got it here and you got a home. So anytime you release anything, you just want to come back and talk some shit, man. Come on. You're welcome anytime, brother. <laughs> okay. Hey, no problem there. <laughs> I know, yeah. We'll get some whiskey to you. James Fox, right. thank you so much, yes. brother. Thank you. Absolutely incredible filmmaker. Absolutely incredible down to earth awesome guy uh easily one of my favorite people in the world this interview has been one of my favorite interviews on this planet one of my favorite conversations i've ever had okay we're fanboyed out here but uh you guys can find him uh in the show notes below his movie will be linked there as well as his call to action you guys reach out jump on board with that let's get to that five hundred thousand that we're talking about here uh, i think we can do it i know we can get on board file that thing and then ship it off to somebody else post it to five of your friends just just get it out there man let's uh, get these representatives starting to tell us what is going on with this thing let's get a call to action going come on rally rally the troops so uh, as far as this show goes you guys we do have a patreon if you find the show valuable you'd like to contribute as much or as little as you want you can do that at expanding reality on patreon.com uh, as far as all the other stuff you can find us on YouTube this video will be on YouTube so go check it 
uh, James out in all of his glory. And then we've got a, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. And then the show, you can email directly at expandingrealitypodcast at gmail.com. Now, a massive thanks again to James Fox. It was so cool. It was so much fun. Uh, if you guys uh, had any questions for him or anything you'd like for me to forward on, please do so at expandingrealitypodcast at gmail.com. I will ship those his way. Uh, other than that, guys, you know the deal. Uh, pick up a piece of litter. Buy a meal for somebody. Just do something nice. Make somebody's day with a smile. It's it's small things like that, guys. We live in a society. Let's keep moving forward here. Let's get out of that left-hand lane. And uh, let's just in general, guys, y'all just be good to each other, okay? Uh, we will see y'all next time. Thank you for listening.